Thanks, Sean. We meet on Yulna land and I pay my respects to the land and to its custodians and its people. I'm going to have to disappoint you, Sean, because uh, what I've prepared today is uh, not about that. But what I will say is uh, talks, all, all the presentations get recorded and uh, are put up on YouTube. So if you want to see what I've said in the past about uh, uh, what Sean's alluded to, they're all on YouTube. YouTube.com slash users slash the Gama Festival and pick videos. I want to direct my comments today to establishment of policy. Too often I've seen policies established on the basis of personal opinion and fail. Think anything that says tough on crime. Too often I've seen policies that might have been effective but strangled by excessive rules and regulations. Think CDP. Too often I've seen bureaucratic silos stifle First Nations desires. Think anywhere where the response from government is, we don't have a bucket for that. And too often First Nations peoples haven't been involved in policies. Policy preparation needs to be driven by the primary stakeholders, the First Nations people. If they don't initiate it and drive it, it is useless. If there's a need for a policy, if a policy is failing, they will know, trust me, they will know. You get the reasons, perhaps get information from previous policy, you distribute the information to the primary, the secondary and the tertiary stakeholders, get their thoughts, distribute their, those thoughts to all the parties, the secondary and uh, tertiary stakeholders, uh, the people who have secondary interests such as the bureaucrats and the tertiary, perhaps the academia or, and so on, who have a, a more remote interest. Having got some information together, you thrash out what the consequences might be, and what the problems might be, what the requirements might be. You establish what's a success cr criteria and you implement it. Now in that process, there will need to be consultation, which is uh, another of my hobby horses. I'm a grumpy old man. I've got plenty of hobby horses. But um, consultation too often is people coming into a community asking to speak to the leaders and telling them what they've already decided. That is just not acceptable. Indigenous people need to be involved from step one, completely, totally, 100% with full information so that they know what's going on. One of the things that I have noted over my 50 odd years involvement is people will come into a community and ask to consult with the leaders and there might be three or four people and you'll get say four people sitting around a table. There'll be three with a salary and travel allowance and one with nothing. Guess who? Just not acceptable. Now, going back to um, gathering information so that it can be distributed to um, all, all the people and so that there can be a, a genuine and legitimate discussion about what might and might not be done. 
Let me try to give you an illustration. In June 2020, YYF, Yothu Hindi Foundation, submitted a paper to a Senate inquiry into food sustainability in remote areas. We did price comparisons of 75 common items and we concluded that the purchasing power of money in the remote Northern Territory communities is in fact 50.7% of what it is in Sydney and Melbourne, 50.7%. So if you're complaining about the prices of lettuces in Melbourne or Sydney, just think of that in that context. There is uh, from Centrelink a remote area supplement, $18.20 a fortnight. So there's a deficiency in the capacity to buy sufficient food of sufficient quality. And I want to link that situation to some research done in the UK, the USA and Europe, particularly in prisons where there's a uh, controlled food intake. By providing particular vitamins and mineral supplements in prison diets, Violence in the initial trial by Bernard Gesch of Oxford in 2002, violence was reduced by 35%. At comparatively little cost, about somewhere between 0.01 and 0.1% of the cost of incarceration. Though that, those findings have been confirmed by other prison studies in, in other parts of the world. Another nutrition study, a longitudinal study over 14 years in Mauritius, 1,000 children from ages 3 to 14, sorry, 11 years. They found the following comparisons with the control group which didn't have nutritional deficiencies. There was a 41% increase in aggression at age eight and a 51% increase in violent and antisocial behaviour at age 17. I'm not suggesting that improving nutrition will instantly solve a violence problem, but surely it seems to me that further investigation is warranted, particularly in remote communities because most communities have only one store and many of those stores are managed or controlled by the Arnhem, either the Arnhem Land Progress Aboriginal Corporation or Outback Stores. So there is detailed information for the food that is sold in each community. What I am suggesting is that there needs to be much closer links between First Nations people, relevant research and policy developers and programs. Driven by First Nations people. Totally 100% involvement at all stages. Final say on the, on the policies that are resolved. And specific collaboration in relation to uh, what might and might not be. There's other research also and many of you would be aware of the work done by Richard Wilkinson and others in relation to the impact of inequality on various social measures where when you got, well, financial inequality is used as a surrogate for um, social inequality and you get a measurable deterioration in a range of social measures as inequality increases. Life expectancy reduces, morbidity increases, violence increases, school dropouts increase, and so on. Mistrust in society. So there are many things that could be used to inform policy, but policy needs to be done and driven by First Nations people. It's a public health issue, in violence, at least in part. It's not a law and order issue. It's a public health issue. And I think 
our policy developers need to pay attention to some of that. Thank you.